on behalf of North Sales again, thanks for coming on board. As I said, Chris and I uh, teamed up when lockdown started and created a new online school. So we've been doing a, a lot of these classes and they've all been recorded and put up in Marine Weather University. Chris put together an incredible curriculum that is worthy of a university course designed for sailors and sailboat racers. And even though I majored in meteorology in college, I learned a ton and it's really helped me. We invite you to come and check it out. There's a lot of free classes there, as well as the two biggies, the fundamentals and the advanced course, the, the multi-class courses that really provide you with that, that, that great foundation in understanding weather. I, and uh, individual classes, I'm rolling out some classes on expedition and we have some classes on individual races as well. And for you guys, special today, special coupon code, remember that, just like the fastest fun sales that are sponsoring this session, uh, coupon code FASTER anywhere in Marine Weather University, that'll get you 10% off should you wanna brass around and pay money. But like I said, there's some free classes here. So the offshore sailing game, let's take a big step back and think about what you guys, I'm assuming most of you are going to be doing the pack cup this year, just like me, are thinking about right now. And it's not too soon to start thinking about this stuff we're talking about today and a lot of other things too before. Uh, setting a plan and setting realistic goals is super important for any uh, endeavor, any sporting endeavor. And it's something, the goals and thinking about how you're going to do it and what you're going to do um, is a step that shouldn't be left aside because in doing so, you can achieve higher, you can make achieve higher ground and get better performance. And you can also, um, by setting realistic goals, focus on the things that are important to you and your team. Preparation is so darn important in any sailboat race. And when going offshore, there's the Rambler 88, um, is critical to performance on the races. My old teammate and skipper, Dennis Connor, used to say, you can't win them all if you don't win the first race. And you can't win the first race if you don't finish. Um, so getting going 22,000 miles across an ocean is no small feat and preparation is a big part of it. Then the next webinar that's coming up, we'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, Seton Weijin and the team from North Sales San Francisco will be talking about sale preparation, which is a big part, optimizing the inventory, et cetera, but preparation runs the gamut. And the cool thing about sailing offshore is that you have to sail you, as fast as you can and safe and safely day and night and you do it shorthanded now most of you are probably going to sail with quote a full offshore size crew some of you may be double handling um, but regardless you're going to be shorthanded because half the crew or thereabouts is going to be down below most of the time while you're trying to sail the boat as fast as possible and that makes in itself for a interesting challenge which requires practice Getting out on the water is a considered to be a good form of preparation, but it's a type of preparation that most teams and most sailing teams don't do enough of before an offshore race. And they spend way too much time on the other kind of preparation, which is important, but there's no time that's, uh, there's nothing more valuable than time on the water. Also, when sailing offshore, you have to optimize your human performance. It's the whole watch system, getting enough rest for the crew, the food, clothing, decision making. It's a fascinating challenge. And then, of course, there's weather strategy and navigation going the right way. And that's what this session today is about. Let's take a look at the big picture of this race course. 2,070 miles, 0.37 thereabouts to uh, the eastern side of Oahu Island. And there, I remember the first time I did a Hawaii race and the, uh, it kind of struck me, well, we got to do a great circle route. So the compass course changes all the way there. And uh, it really is kind of moot when you get down and start doing the race, but it always kind of, uh, anytime you go east to west on the planet, you will find that the shortest distance is on a mercator chart, which is produced so that the latitude and longitude grid lines are equidistant and perpendicular to each other, looks like a big curve. 
you map it on a globe, it makes perfect sense. In the big picture, you have the North Pacific High, which Chris is going to be talking about, a semi-permanent feature. It's keeping us very dry here in San Diego these days. And down to the south, you have trade winds. And uh, those are the two sort of big picture components in the race. The first part of the race, zooming in, sort of 30 percent or so, is a tight reach, and it can be quite windy. It, it can be uh, the uh, just uh, in this section right here. You can see that we have uh, the uh, quite uh, the the windiest section of the race, at least for this particular weather model. And it's a hard reach. The wind is ahead of the beam at first and slowly comes to the beam, et cetera. So this, this first part of the race can be quite windy, rough, and cold. It is a tough, generally can be the toughest part of the race. And once you make it through, you feel like you've definitely um, gotten, uh, gotten the, uh, you've, 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 you've made a, uh, progress. The final 70% of the race is a downwind sleigh ride. Here's, I've tried to draw it to the finish here. And of course, you may not be on the rum line like the Matson line ship is when it's going from San Francisco to Hawaii. But the wind, that because of the shape of the Pacific High, because of the northeast trade winds down in the temperate latitudes in the latitude in the, near the equator, the it becomes a downwind race which is why we all like doing it and uh we don't have to go back upwind just the delivery crew now my um good friend and arguably the most famous modern navigator in america if not the world and the guy that designed the yellow first down line that we'll be enjoying on sunday in the super bowl stan honey also my college roommate um, has given a lot of seminars on this. And in fact, I'm going to share um, in Marine Weather University for you guys his, uh, some of his presentation. Um, he kind of breaks up these Hawaii races in stages, which is a good way to think about tactically and uh, for any offshore race rather than thinking of it, breaking it down. And his stages are the start to the synoptic breeze to that west westerly then reaching to the ridge, that heavy air reach, and the crucial decision of picking the waypoint of where you're going to cross the ridge. Chris will be talking about the, that ridge um, in more detail in a minute. Um, as Stan points out, there can be these cutoff low features that can change the big picture from what I described and make it a lot more complicated. And then, uh, but typically you get to the ridge and the sleigh ride begins and we get into what Stan calls the slot car phase, VMG mode with a twist. Um, in the downwind section of the race, we start getting and experiencing uh, more uh, cloud effect and squall effect. Chris will be talking about that as you get down into the more um, tropical latitudes as sometimes builds up. It de de depending on the race and the setup and the scenario, uh, the meteorology of the situation, there may be squalls may be the, the big one of the big factors in the race, or they could be not that big of a deal, it varies year to year. And then finally, the stages of the race to, is you have to pick your corner for that final approach into the finish. So let's take a look at the stages in a little bit more detail. Uh, race start starting line off the uh, St. Francis and buoy and the um, deck, race deck and out and they always start you in an ebb tide. I haven't even looked at the tides, but I'm sure you guys will be on an ebb. Well, you guys, we guys too, uh, hopefully we will. But it's important, obviously you guys are, many of you have say, raced from San Francisco Bay, know how important it is. And just in that short distance from here to Bonita, start to Bonita, how much of a gain or loss can occur by playing the local knowledge and the currents right. And there's a shot from Expedition Software with a high resolution current model that you can get to help you figure out your tactics. And um, part of this first phase is basically getting out the bay and then getting the synoptic wind. This is kind of an extreme example, but 
there's a synop what we'd call a synoptic win, the, the high pressure, the isobars, the, the, ab the land effect and the thermal effect from land is going away and how far away the synoptic wind varies year to year as does where the ridge is. So, um, but as this first step is, the stand points out, you need to get to the breeze and do whatever you have to do to get to the breeze. Um, and so that's your first order of business. You'll, to do that, you'll be looking at high resolution models. Um, here's an example here of a weather model in expedition and each grid point as each little piece of data is marked by a wind barb in this case. This is quarter degree GFS model, which we might use a lot in routing our, our way to Hawaii, but a high resolution model is much finer mesh than this. Here you can see that same, I've zoomed in now, and I've downloaded the HRR, and the high resolution models are going to do a much better job and much more help in getting you out to that synoptic wind. All this information is the type of, um, and then you're going to study the previous days and the previous starts to see what works. One thing I like looking at, I just pulled up an image of the, um, the interpolated wind that's available on one of the NOAA sites that is uh, that I tend to look at so I can watch the behavior of how the sea breeze comes in every day. Now moving on to the race strategy and reaching to the ridge. Here we have, again, Crystal point out the ridge here. This is an image of the weather last year about race start time. So random July 20, middle of July, 2021. And the high is pretty well behaved and the ridge is coming across. And we have uh, the decision point is, well, how do you, where do you want to cross that ridge and get into your slot cars? It's a crucial race decision. Obviously, if you were, uh, you're a sailboat, so you're going to do, you're going to try to sail as fast as you can and sail, still sail as least amount of distance as possible. But normally sailing all the way up on the rum line, that great circle route takes you in a, to a tighter, slower, more uncomfortable reach and puts you very close to the light winds of the high. So um, the typical route is to deviate and shred below it a little bit more and get to the where the wind comes aft. That is where that the wind, the turn in the wind is, the ridge um, occurs without sailing, giving up too much extra distance and getting into the right lane for that whole slot car section of the race, which we'll look at right now. The, it affects your reaching angle and the distance sail, that race decision of where are you gonna cross the ridge and Stan gives some rules on general latitude and longitude rules as to where um, to cross, depending on the position of the high. Chris will probably talk about it a little bit more too. And it, that decision made right now, where you're going to get across this ridge will affect how all the remaining phases play off, play out. Once you've picked your waypoint, your, your point to cross the ridge, you're going to have the crew VMCing towards that waypoint. So you're not steering a compass course, there'll be puffs and lulls even that in that cold, rough section, and you're still racing a sailboat to get there fast. You're, you're through the ridge, all of a sudden, in, in just a matter of hours, it seems you've gone from reef and possibly reef if it's a windy race and uh, with small head sails to you've got your helix reaching sails up and you're you're starting you'll soon have your vmg sails up it seems like you never can get them up soon enough and you're into the slot car section racing to the shift basically thinking of this race as a big right hand shift see the wind if i uh you can probably see my mouse now as, as you look at this optimum course here, which is an average one for that race in 2021 that I just did for expedition, I did an optimal routing. We can see that the, uh, the, the wind starts off northeast, comes more east, and finally, depending on the position of the high, could become east or even a little bit southeast. And there are some factors that Chris will talk about that will affect that. So you're basically sailing a downwind leg in this phase with a right shift. Where do you want to go? If you're going to get a right shift going downwind, we should do a quiz. But if it was a one mile leg and 
everything else was e equal and you're going to get a 10 degree right shift, you'd go off on starboard jive first. And then once you get lifted, you would jive and that would be how you take advantage of the wind shift. Well, you do the same thing here, except you've got this death zone up in the center of the high. The best point across the ridge allows you in many years to sail fast VMG angles, ocean VMG. Normally, whether you're going upwind and upwind ra or reaching race like the Bermuda race or a downwind race like a, one of these Hawaii races, you rarely sail the boat on your inshore mode when you're sailing offshore. It's because you're going towards the next shift. And um, so you basically are trying to take advantage of that angular change. You're not sailing in a steady breeze. How does this work? Well, let's just go back to a polar diagram. Imagine the wind is coming from the top straight down the screen here, okay? Straight down, and this is a polar diagram. Each one of these little rings is a diff for a different wind speed. So here I picked, let's say it's the 16 knot curve. So here, right along this line here, which is darker, in expedition is the polar curve. So this is how fast we would go in length of a vector at a 120 degree wind angle. This is how fast we go in length from that point there to there in 135. And right here where this blue line is, is the best VMG point for that polar. And the way expedition or anybody or designer, anybody calculates the optimum VMG angle is to draw perpendicular off of that wind direction, which in this case is the red wind, and wherever that line is tangent to the curve, wherever that point is the best VMG. That's how you get downwind the fastest. But the wind's going to shift. It's gonna to shift to a blue wind. In this case, it's a left shift. Sorry about that, but it works for our diagram. So the VMC targets are best. Sailing ocean VMG angles, hotter, faster than VMG to get farther down, the ladder rungs, because we're no longer racing down these, remember the America's Cup and the ladder rungs? The ladder rungs, once the wind shifts, are all going to be a, the blue, the angle of the blue ladder rung there. So even when we're sailing in the red wind, if we sail off target, hotter than target, we will get further down these, the new ladder rungs that you're, we're expecting. And if our forecast is good, and we get that shift, we're going to be, at, by sailing these hotter angles, we're going to be ahead of a boat that sails inshore strictly VMG. This we, we called this wallying back in the day in the America's Cup. And, but having tools and having the whole crew, the speed team being aware of the difference between ocean VMG or hot VMG, VMG and deep VMG or inshore sailing mode is important. And there's times, even in this race, when you have to employ all of these different um, modes of downwind VMG sailing. If you get too far north, then you, as Stan points out, you have to sail that inshore VMG, the deeper angles, and find whatever reason you can to step south because you're too close to the high. So, uh, when you do that, and even in a perfect, if you're in the perfect slot, and this is the slot car phase, right about to here, like I'll draw on it just to, right about from, from there to there is the slot car phase. And um, we, uh, when you stay mostly on starboard jive, but even in this route, you can see it did a little step down. And as, as it points out, even in the perfect slot, you sometimes might step down a little bit, jive and big shifts like ones that you'll find in the, um, that you'll find in, uh, as you get further south. All right, so the, I'm gonna turn off annotation for a second if I can, yep. It's expensive to change early in the race when starboard jibe is so favored, when the wind's still so left, it's expensive to step down, but it's more expensive not to do it if you have to. And these are decisions that are made in the slot car phase. Get it right, you can just stay on starboard and go till you have to jibe, a normal race. Then finally, 
the run phase of the race, which could be half the race. Once you get dead upwind to the finish line, you got to pick your corner. Here you see an ensemble run of a bunch of optimal routes, some coming in from the right on, on Port Jibe and some coming in on Starboard Jibe from the south. All that is dependent on the wind that you get. I pointed out that there is a natural right shift. If the high didn't move, if there are no subtropical stuff going on, there's a natural right shift as you move to Hawaii. But, and you, that you typically tend to play that, but overriding that because we're racing are all the other features that happen in real life and weather. When the high moves around, when it pulses, the diurnal breathing, um, tropical waves uh, spin off the, um, down the Mexican and Costa Rican coast and start moving towards Hawaii. All right, Chris, that's the, the big picture of strategy. And I'm going to stop my share and uh, give you a, uh, the floor. All right. Thanks, Peter. Good, good introduction and a reminder of how a, uh, a more or less one leg race can become very complicated <laughs> very quickly. Um, so let's, let's uh, talk a bit about the weather. Obviously, uh, it's a, uh, it, it's a key part of this race and, and knowing about all those different uh, features that uh, Peter was uh, talking about is, is super important. And uh, whenever you're uh, going on a yacht race, no matter how many times you've done it, it's always a good idea to just go all the way back as if you know nothing and just kind of refresh yourself on the basics. Peter pointed out some of the, some of the basic features. What I've done here is I put up an average weather map for summer over the uh, Northeast Pacific Ocean. And the colors here represent pressure. So the warmer colors are higher pressure, the colder colors are lower pressure. And uh, each one of these uh, different color bands is about two millibars. So if you're referencing your, uh, what you might see on your barometer, uh, that's, that's what you'd be looking for. So uh, the important, there's, there's our course obviously, and the important feature as Peter pointed out is that Pacific high. This is a semi-permanent feature, uh, particularly uh, strong in the summertime. Uh, why? Because the ocean is cold. Pressure is inversely proportional to temperature. So you have cold temperatures, you generally have higher pressure. You have warmer temperatures, you have lower pressure. And uh, in fact, in the wintertime, the pressure drops somewhat uh, uh, over the, the uh, North Pacific and the high pressure shift is, shifts onto the continents because the continents are colder in the wintertime relative to the ocean, which stays a more or less constant temperature over the course of the year. So this high is basically at its peak in, uh, in July when this race is run. And uh, it's, uh, uh, while it does, it is a very strong feature. It's almost always there in some shape or form. It is not necessarily static and it does tend to move around. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Now, the other feature that Peter was mentioning that's really super important for this race is the subtropical ridge. It's a ridge axis basically that sticks out from the high down to the Southeast. What is a ridge? A ridge is just like it is, a, if let's say you have a mountain, that would be your high pressure. And then off the mountain, you had a ridge, a physical ridge, sort of a high point that, that's dropping down as it goes away from the mountain, but it's higher than, than uh, three sides around it. It's higher up to the high pressure and then lower down to the uh, edge of the ridge, down uh, to the lower edge of the ridge and then lower on either side of the ridge. It's exactly what, what a ridge is. It's like an elongation essentially of the high pressure. And <clears throat> it represents a location where there's usually some kind of a, a wind shift uh, and also lower wind speed on average, because if you look closely, you'll see that just, just slightly so, the, uh, the isobars are a little bit further apart around the ridge. So if we look um, uh, at the ridge axis here, um, for example, if I can get this to work, it doesn't seem to be working at the moment, but if we look at the ridge, ridge axis um, here, that's, that's the, uh, the isobars are just a little bit further apart. And um, then if you look up to the north, you see the isobars are look closer together. So we have stronger winds there, lighter winds here, and then further away to the east, sorry, southwest from the ridge axis, stronger winds again. We'll see that a little bit more in detail when we look at the average wind fields. 
So those are the main pressure features in this race. Now, what happens with the wind? In the Northern hemisphere, wind circulates in a clockwise manner around high pressure areas. So the, the wind is, is, is moving clockwise around this high pressure area. So we have tend to have northerly winds to the uh, eastern periphery of the high and then uh, easterly component winds to the southern periphery of the high. So we're kind of sailing through this southeast quadrant of the Pacific high pressure. So we expect our winds to go from sort of a north into an east direction as we work our way down the track. You also notice that the wind sort of spirals out from the center of the high pressure. It doesn't strictly follow the isobars. Why is that? There is sinking air in the middle of the high pressure. So the air is sinking down and then it spreads outward from the high pressure. And then the Coriolis effect causes it to turn and move to the right and, uh, and make this, this circulation pattern. Now, what this does is it sets up the uh, sort of permanent, semi-permanent uh, winds that we have uh, blowing across the Pacific Ocean. Down to the south, which is where we're headed, down toward Hawaii, with, we have the trade winds. So these are the warm, uh, humid winds that blow generally from east to west down at lower latitudes, uh, north of the doldrums or north of the equator down here to the south. To the north of the high, we have, have the westerlies. So up here is where uh, the wind is basically going from west to east. And this is where weather occurs. If you look up here north of the high pressure, you can see that there's this elongation of lower pressure up here. And this is the storm track. So this is where all the weather is taking place. And it's really the weather up here that controls the position of, this, of, the, uh, of the Pacific high. So when we're forecasting the position of this Pacific high, we're not just looking down here at uh, sort of 35 uh, degrees north. We're looking way up here, north of 50 north, up here. What is happening up here in the North Pacific to uh, drive the position of this, this high pressure area? And so if we look at the, what happened during the last race, we see a little bit of that right off the bat. So this is the surface analysis uh, from NOAA that was drawn on the start day of the, of the last race, July 9th. And I've drawn the course on here. So we've got the uh, start up, up here in San Francisco Bay uh, and then extending down here to, to Oahu. And um, what we'll see is a not typical pattern, right? It doesn't really match up specifically with our, with our average uh, pattern here. And at this time we have a low pressure area storm system has come across the North Pacific and is, is off the uh, Northwest coast. And what that has done, it has weakened and shifted the Pacific high to the South. It's also split it in two. So there's one weaker section that's closer to, to San Francisco here. And then the main Pacific high, which is out here North Northwest of Hawaii. And so we, we started out that race with a, uh, sort of an atypical pattern. But as the race progressed, we returned back to a more normal pattern. That little low pressure area moved up inshore, weakened and went away and allowed the, the Pacific high to kind of reestablish itself, move back to the east and to the north, closer to its normal position. And in fact, it's, it's returned and it's even stronger than average at this time. And then as we go into uh, the next day, the second day after the start, we see that that high is even stronger and we have that pressure pattern I was talking about. And one of the things that's occurred is that the, the um, uh, subtropical ridge has sort of shifted to the south and west. It's actually moved a little bit away from the coast. So as you started the race, you would have been chasing that ridge. And if you based it upon just the, for, the position up here early on, you basically would be, it, it was moving to the southwest almost at the same speed as you were. And then eventually it kind of stopped and you were able to cross it and get back into the sort of normal pattern. So that these features are not static. They are always moving, and that's what you have to work uh, on with respect to the forecast is what's going to happen to these features and how are they going to impact your routing uh, down the course. Uh, and then as we went into uh, the third day of the race, we see the Pacific high now is a little bit more static and um, the uh, trade winds are well established down here to the south. And one interesting thing is that low pressure is moving off the west coast behind you. And what that is doing, it's pushing 
uh, it's, it's tightening up the isobars further offshore. So the back markers in the fleet, the slower boats that are taking longer to get away from the coast, actually get a, a build that comes in from behind them uh, with, as, as this cutoff low, Peter mentioned, and, and uh, what Stan says, that these cutoff lows can be important sometimes on the track. And indeed, uh, if this race had started two or three days later, it would have been everything about this particular race is what was this this cutoff low doing and what was going to do sort of a very atypical uh, situation here but in this case here you're far enough down the track that you're able to stay in this sort of more typical uh, pattern on the approach to to uh, to the finish and here's uh, the weather map on the 15th that that low has dissipated by that time and that you can see the pacific high kind of moving back so the pacific high is always going through this sort of oscillation of uh, development, depending on what's happening up here to the north, what's coming off uh, the, the California coast. And it, so it goes through this, this uh, oscillation where it strengthens, moves to the north, and then a weather system comes along, causes it to weaken, and then push back down to the south again. So if we look at the average wind field, uh, this is <clears throat> the uh, average winds um, around the Pacific High, and we can see that circulation that I was talking about, and the colors here uh, relate to um, the wind speed. So the hot colors are high wind speeds, the cold colors are low wind speeds. My apologies, this is in meters per second, just multiply it by two and you'll be pretty close to what it is in knots. Um, so basically, as Peter pointed out, oftentimes the windiest part of the race is right here off the off the coast right off of san francisco where those isobars are compressed up we have low pressure over the continent of of north america high pressure pushing in on the coast here a strong temperature contrast between the cold air offshore and the warm air over the interior uh, west and that causes a very strong uh, pressure gradient and wind along the coast then as you head to the south, you'll notice that the winds ease off a little bit. And what does this easing area respond, correspond to? Our, our uh, subtropical ridge. So that ridge axis right here is, a, is an area where the winds are lighter. But you'll also notice the winds are veering, aren't they? They're basically veering from a north, northwest, northerly direction around to a northeast and eventually uh, east northeast trade wind direction, which is the more typical trade wind direction that we would normally get uh, as we sail south of the Pacific High. So this area right here, how you attack this this shift and pressure uh, region is critically important. There's always a tendency to want to stay a little bit further to the south um, to stay in a little bit better pressure, but you have to make sure that that balances out with the shift and where you want to be relative to the uh, the trade winds uh, as you get further down into that slot car section that, that Peter was uh, mentioning. So we can take each uh, and look at the actual wind along the route just to get a bit of a flavor. And so uh, at each one of these stars have, uh, have presented a wind rose, which is based upon satellite data. And a wind rose is basically a frequency diagram uh, for wind uh, speed and direction. The length of the, the, the rose petals uh, gives us the frequency that the wind blows from that direction. So in this case here, uh, off of San Francisco, the wind blows from the north northwest about 61% of the time. And then the colors here tell us how um, how uh, strong the wind blows uh, within each one of these petals, or, or how frequently the wind blows in a particular wind speed range along each one of these petals. So in this example here, we've got uh, the 15 to 20 knot band right here, which extends, um, I guess each one of these is 20%. So it extends from about 15% up to about 45%. So a solid 30% uh, of the time, the wind is basically in that 15 to 20 knot range out there. And then uh, another 15% of the time, it's it's uh, 20 to 25 knots out, out off of San Francisco. So pretty windy right off the bat. Similar uh, when the wind is from the north there, uh, also very strong winds. You'll notice that very infrequently does it blow any other direction uh, out in that area, but it's not unheard of. You saw that little low pressure on that that chart that I showed you that ended up off of San Francisco. So that accounts for some of these unusual wind directions uh, that we, we see here. Sometimes uh, a small percentage of the time, but maybe just under 5%, it blows anywhere from the west around to the southeast. 
Uh, okay, let's go a little further down the track, sort of the midpoint of the race. Now, this is where we're getting to the other side of that ridge axis. And you see that the winds are uh, shifting around now more from the northeast and they're basically split um, about 60%, 62% of the time between the uh, northeast and the east-northeast. All right, so once you get around that ridge and get down more south of the Pacific High, the wind is going to start to come in uh, more uh, direct downwind along the, the course to Hawaii. Um, and you also see that the winds aren't quite as strong um, as, as they were off of San Francisco, a little bit lighter winds in this area. But if we look up to the north and to the south, because you don't always sail right down the, the uh, Great Circle course, of course, you're going to pick uh, a route to the south or to the north. If we look first to the north, that's this star here, it's up closer to the um, uh, high pressure center. So you'll see there the winds are, are on average lighter, but also distributed over a wide range of directions. All right, so uh, up close to that high pressure, you have much more variable winds. It, it all depends on where that Pacific high is moving. Remember in that cycle that I was talking about as it sort of oscillates and meanders around relative to what's happening in the westerlies to the north. And then if we go to the south of that <clears throat> midpoint, we see a very strong northeast wind uh, frequency. And that's where we're solidly in the trade winds. We also see that the average wind speed is, is higher. So winds tend to be higher south of the, the rum line. They tend to be lighter up to the north of the rum line. And then we also have this more variable wind up to the north. But it's always a balance between getting the right shift and staying in the pressure. That's what a lot of this race is about. Now on the final approach to Hawaii, we're in uh, more persistent winds and uh, the winds are also veered around more to the east, northeast and east. And uh, uh, also again, a bit stronger because we're down solidly in the trade winds. We're away from the high pressure up here. We've got strong, uh, relatively strong or fresh pressure gradient really uh, down closer to Hawaii. So there, there's a very uh, 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 typical pattern that the wind uh, sets up on this race. And that's why we look at these sort of uh, classic uh, conditions uh, and, and our placement in particular with respect to the subtropical ridge uh, getting down the track. Now, Peter also mentioned that as you get down into trade winds, especially uh, clouds and squalls start to become important. So it's, it's good to kind of uh, understand how winds work around uh, clouds. And there's two types of clouds. There's sucking clouds, those that are not raining. Uh, that's where the air is in an updraft mode. And winds behave a particular way around those clouds. And basically where the wind is getting sucked in uh, to support the updraft of the cloud, we have a lighter wind field. This is a model example of what the wind might look like around a, a cumulus cloud. So you're looking down on the cloud here, where at the center of the cloud is roughly where the plus sign is, or the strongest updraft there. And what we see here is lighter winds to the downwind side of the cloud, so to the west side of the cloud in the, in the trade winds, and then stronger winds because they're filling in to, to, to support that updraft on the windward side of the cloud. Um, and then the cloud would be tending to move sort of in the direction that the uh, gradient winds are dictating. In this case, uh, because we're in the trade wind, some sort of east component down to the west. All right, so that's an updraft cloud. And then you also have to uh, understand how winds behave around a downdraft cloud, one that is producing rain. So this is a picture of a downdraft cloud and you can see the rain shaft uh, coming out of this cloud just down here at the, at the bottom, down in this area here. So in this case, where we have the rain uh, coming down, the wind is in downdraft mode. The rain is sort of dragging the wind down and it hits the water and it spreads out in all directions. And uh, what happens in these cases is that we end up with stronger winds, the opposite basically of the, the cloud in updraft mode. We end up with stronger winds on the west side uh, generally of the cloud and lighter winds on the uh, windward side of the clouds because basically here because the, the air is spreading out the the outdraft negates the inflow 
uh, part of the, or the, tra the uh, gradient portion of the flow. And so you end up with lighter winds. So you produce, basically it's best to avoid going to the uh, windward side of, of a uh, precipitating cloud. And if it's possible, try to move to the, to the uh, uh, leeward side here to get that extra pressure where the gradient and the outflow are uh, additive. So just it's important to understand how the winds work around those those squall clouds. Now, one of the things that you can do with um, with historical data is run a lot of simulations, and and through that you can actually develop a climatology specific to your boat. And uh, so this is not just looking at the general wind patterns as we just have, but how your boat would look uh, put into that that average. Uh, situation. So in this case here, what we can do is we can develop race specific true angles and true wind speed probability tables. That is how, you know, what is the probability of you sailing a particular true wind angle and true wind speed? Um, and this information can be useful to develop your sail uh, inventory, identify any holes that might be in place. Like if you end up with a particular true wind angle wind speed where you're weak, um, that looks like it could, you know, it could be 10% of the time or something, then you can actually try and fill that prior to the, to the race. And then some, sometimes you can also use this to optimize a rating, whether or not to take a spinnaker pole, for example. Um, and the simulations can be done to a specific polar. So your boat's polar can be put in this in, in and uh, run through the, the data set. Now, where do you get this data set? Well, there are lots of different, um, uh, uh, programs that you can you can use. I've provided uh, one five-year data set here. I ran some simulations, which I'll show you in a minute. It's a quarter degree resolution uh, 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 spatially, and uh, the data that I ran here was a one-hour resolution. And uh, I ran 30 simulations a year, so we have five years of that, and uh, centered on the race start date. You don't start on the exact date. You want to build a what is uh, climatologically possible. So uh, the weather doesn't care if it's July 9th or if it's July 1st or it's July uh, 17th. So you wanna capture as much of what you could be sailing in as possible. So you run uh, a number of dates either side of the start date um, and capture a reasonable range of possible weather conditions. Now I have made, if you have access to um, something like Expedition, you can, use this data set. I've put it on my website, which is available at this web address. And uh, what you want to do is click on the file share um, option up here, and then you will log in. Uh, and it'll bring this, this page up. But in order to download, you'll just need to log in. So you'll set up a login. I'll approve it and at, at no cost. And you'll have access to this, this data. There's five years of data here, uh, 20 uh, 17 through uh, 2021 uh, data. So it does go back to 2018. So you can look at, at the uh, weather conditions that actually occurred. Now, don't expect you to be able to, to duplicate the route though, that the winning boat took. Why? Because the winning, the, the, the computer has perfect weather knowledge. It knows what the weather is going to do the whole way along the course. But when you sailed that route, you didn't. So it's highly unlikely that the winning boat took the most uh, optimum route as the computer would see it. Also, there are differences between reality and model. So there's going to be some differences. Like I said, you can, you can do this for your polar. I did it for a TP-52 and a Cal-40 in this case, uh, two very different polars, obviously. And uh, once you, you can run uh, through that five-year data set. On the left is the cloud of routes that developed, that, that were put forth by a TP-52. On the right is a cloud of routes from a Cal-40. And you'll notice here that, that uh, uh, similar shape that, that uh, Peter was pointing out, where it heads down to the subtropical ridge, which is somewhere in this area right here. And then it shifts into a slot car mode. And sometimes the slot cars are farther south. Sometimes they're further to the north. The Cal-40, um, is, is similar, but one thing you'll notice between the TP-52 and the Cal-40 is that the, the, uh, the clouds are narrower in the Cal-40 case, and that has to do with the polar. If you look at the, the way the polar is, uh, the performance of that boat look, works, 
it has similar performance at a wider range of uh, wind angles, whereas the TP-52 is optimized to, to a certain set of wind angles. Um, so this would be the uh, summary table for the TP-52, and you can see that 150 true wind angle is where almost 50% of the sailing is done in this race, and uh, also basically between about sort of 14 and 22, 24 knots uh, is where most of the sailing is done on the TP-52. And, the, and, and again, this, the way this polar looks, it has this, this very uh, strong bulge in those running wind angles. And that's why uh, so, so much of the, uh, the performance is pushed down to that, that angle. Now, in the case of the Cal 40, you'll see it is much broader. And uh, you'll see that there is a, a broader range, basically of similar uh, probability between 120 and sort of 1, 165, 170 wind angles. And again, that's because of this, the way the polar uh, performance is, is very broad in the, in the Cal 40, much different from the uh, TP52. All right, so that's sort of uh, where a lot of what you can do. Another thing you can do with all those, those uh, grip files is just let them run through and watch them. It allows you to see how the weather evolves. So there is both wind, 10 meter wind speed and surface pressure. So you can see how the Pacific high is developing, how it moves around, meanders around. And uh, that if, the more you watch that, the more you'll, uh, uh, you'll get out of, out of uh, you, the more you'll understand how the weather works in the Northeast Pacific Ocean. Now, it's always good to start preparing now. So one of the things you wanna do is uh, identify a few resources that, uh, that are useful. The, ocean, the NOAA Ocean Prediction Center is always a good one. They do excellent analyses of the um, uh, Pacific Ocean, Northeast Pacific Ocean. Uh, they're free. These are, these are uh, meteorologist interpreted analyses. These are not just machine drawn. There's actually all the model data goes in here, the satellite data goes in here and a meteorologist does their own interpretation of what's going on. So they're quite useful uh, plots. There's also upper air information uh, for those of you that um, have some knowledge about how the, the 500 millibar uh, works with respect to the surface weather, that information can be found there as well. And then, of course, there's sea state and current information, too. But one of the uh, cool things is that Nick White in an expedition has made it possible to actually pull those analyses directly into expedition so that you can uh, use the um, put, uh, plot your course and your um, maybe your optimum route prediction on some of those surface charts. That's very useful. And then the next thing that's quite useful is being able to overlay a grib file, a model uh, representation of what's going on. And this is a really good way to check um, how well the model is doing relative to the meteorologist forecast or relative to the analysis. If there's differences between the model and the analysis, then you have to be wary of the forecast because uh, it may not be picking up something that the meteorologist is seeing. All right, so this is a really useful uh, little functionality that, that uh, uh, Expedition has. And then, of course, at the OPC site, you can get the, uh, the text forecasts and also discussions uh, related to the uh, Northeast Pacific waters. Those are also oftentimes useful to look out. But most importantly, they, they give you any warnings or su uh, such. You do have to occasionally watch for tropical systems. It's pretty rare, but sometimes there can be the odd tropical storm. Uh, this forms to the <clears throat> southeast of Hawaii, and not necessarily a direct hit on the course area, but some of those rem remnants can have an impact. So that's another thing to always keep an eye on. And then, and then the other thing is satellite imagery, super important, super valuable in this race. And there's a couple different websites. This one here is a little bit bandwidth heavy, but it does have all the satellite imagery you'd ever want to uh, be able to, to uh, look at. Uh, this one here is a lower bandwidth option, and you can actually set it up beforehand to download directly uh, from the internet, so you don't from the web address, so you don't have to go through the high bandwidth uh, website, um, and it'll download these types of fixed images along the the route. So, uh, satellite imagery, really valuable stuff. And then, as Peter pointed out, you're going to be using model data. So, there's different models that you can use. The uh, 
Uh, the global models will allow you to do routing along the entire course from start to finish and also through the entire length of the race, forecasting out up 10 to 15 days. Uh, you'll notice, and, and, and what I did here is I kept the resolution. So you'll notice that this image looks a little pixelated. That's the, the raw resolution of, of this model. So um, that's, that's the detail that you can get out of this model. But there are more detailed models. We can go to the regional models like the NAM um, or the COAMPS and they'll give us a bit more uh, detail, you'll see that the pixelation isn't quite as bad, but they don't cover the entire course. However, they will work for you to connect out to the uh, subtropical ridge and also connecting from the coastal breezes out to the gradient offshore. And then finally, as Peter pointed out, the, uh, the HRRR, which I just call the rapid refresh because HRRR makes me sound like a pirate. Um, but uh, the rapid refresh is a very good model, but it is only very close to the coast and only runs out for a short uh, length of time. So excellent for getting you out of San Francisco Bay and into the gradient immediately offshore, but then you need to switch over to some of these other models. So really a uh, good idea to start getting uh, uh, accustomed to those models. And um, that's something that you can start now. Now is the time to, to uh, improve your weather knowledge for this race. You have the time to do it. And it doesn't take much time a day. And the more you do it now, the easier it will become to start in July. So become familiar with the weather patterns over the North and Tropical Pacific. Review this historical weather data, the grid files that I've put up, for example, uh, animate through historical routing, and then monitor the ocean prediction charts on a daily basis. The more you look at those charts, the easier it will become for you to interpret them and the more you'll understand about how the weather works in, in the North Pacific. Granted, the weather now is very different from what it's going to be, but it can still be a valuable learning experience and bring you something that you can, you can take on. And then as, as, as Peter pointed out, another thing you can do is take uh, relative uh, uh, relevant weather navigation courses, reach out for some coaching. And as he said, we have some excellent um, content. There's in particular a couple of different courses uh, that I might recommend. One is satellite interpretation uh, is really useful. Um, and then there's also a model interpretation or a model course that tells all about models and their weaknesses and their strengths and what you can and cannot expect from weather models. It's really valuable stuff. Um, but obviously, one thing in weather is not independent of another. So the more classes you can take, uh, the more you're going to understand uh, what, to, what to do. And then coming up next week, we have a course on uh, wind shifts that we'll be, be presenting. So um, any, as I said, start looking at the weather data now and get used to uh, what, um, uh, what, what, what the charts look like. And... Uh, Start your weather preparation now. Don't wait. Peter. All right, Chris. Thank you. Very, very informative as always. And it just wets the whistle. You should you have a peek at the chat room and you'll see what I mean. The, uh, the, uh, I will reiterate what Chris says is that, you know, we talked about the practice and preparation later, the ability to get the most out of the weather information that is available out there is not trivial. And to do it when you're sleep deprived on in a low bandwidth environment, sounds a little bit like being on a boat in the Pacific Cup is a real challenge, but it's a fun game. And the, the ability to use your mind and your eyes to, enha to enhance what information you can get, whether you're sitting at home with a fast, connection or on a boat where you're barely you're struggling to get in any sort of information at all is is an important part of the game it's not only fun but the human mind you know the human mind enhances everything that's available and as chris points out that that weather models course course which puts the fear of god in all of you that use these things to i don't know if you can see it with the with the background but the, these things to predict the weather it's uh there, there's a lot there and the ability to use your mind and to get smarter about the weather is a good way to prepare for this race and all your other races. All right, I'm going to um, 
head off into the, uh, the rest of my presentation, which is on navigating. Chris, I got the uh, full screen up again there. Uh, yes, you do. All good. Great. Um, preparation, instruments, polars, weather data, routing, data access. There's a lot going on. That's me racing in a Hawaii race. And there's uh, an example of one of the uh, ensemble routing that was done uh, for one of the Hawaii races. So much of what I do, you have to use some tools in order to be able to do this job well, the navigation job. And I don't own any shares in Expedition, but I've used it all my, uh, for a lot of my racing career. It's a powerful tool. I really like it. It's pretty intuitive and easy to use. It changes all the time and gets better. But uh, it's one of about three or four sailing programs that you might consider to help you do some of the jobs that you have to do as a navigator. Number one, instrument tuning. Um, calibration is ongoing and very, very important because uh, the in the weather routing game, it's garbage in, garbage out. And there's three thing, three basic pieces of information that go into weather routing. A, a grip file, a weather forecast, which Chris talked a little bit about the strengths and weaknesses and the, um, of those. Two is the route, pretty simple. It's to a waypoint that you've set, like if you're VMCing to the your ridge waypoint or if you're routing all the way to Hawaii. And then there's the boat's polar. And to get the boat's polar as accurate as possible, you have you have to get that from sailing the boat. You can get it from the designer for you from US sailing, but that's a starting point. And the ability to get your sailing instruments up to snuff has multifold benefits. And it's something that never ends. In the Transpac last year, I was still doing wind calibrations and boat speed calibrations, tiny, tiny ones on Piwacket. And we had put in a lot of time. Boat speed cows, I, I use strip chart. Here's an image of the strip chart uh, trace um, and wind boat speed cows and wind cows are the two main things that you're working on in calibration world. I, uh, compass is another standard one, and but that's something that you do uh, with your standard compass swinging uh, protocol and good positioning the compass so nobody puts a battery next to it. Polar refinement is an ongoing process too. It's something that I do about three times a year on a boat if I'm sailing on a boat regularly. I don't change the polars all the time. Uh, I try to keep my polars as smooth and simple as possible. Here you see a good example. When you get the polars from US Sailing or Designers, BPP, there might be 20, these are rows of wind angle and boat speed pairs. So the blue is the optimum upwind, reaching, downwind. A typical polar that I would use for racing on a boat that I'm routing to Hawaii would have, this has what will one, the zero and the 180 won't count. So it has one, two, three, four pairs. I might have five pairs of data, but I wouldn't have every 10 degrees. I wouldn't have every knot of wind speed. I'd make it as, um, as smooth as possible, to make it as smooth as possible and easy to adjust as possible, I would have very, really well thought out steps here and not too many of them. Maybe three pairs of steps, true wind angle boat speed pairs between upwind and downwind. You get your polar data and you get most of your polar data you get when you're racing. Of course, we mostly race inshore, which you could argue isn't that helpful for offshore sailing, but it is the same boat. Weather information, um, here's an example of an expedition, the page that opens up to get the freely available, and this is how you um, get past the racing rules of sailing uh, requirement um, for outside help. Uh, the freely available sail docs um, data, which is just basically mining in to the NOAA website, which is where our tax dollars have created these, uh, allowed us to create, get these great weather models. And uh, you go into an expedition and it's a pretty easy download. There's a number of ways to get to the sail docs grip file, but you got to get a grip file in. 
you have to prepare for low bandwidth. I like the fact that Chris, although he sh he shared some links there, and like he said, that satellite um, and radar course in Marine Weather University is super valuable, as is the internet in Marine Weather. Um, he, Chris shares a lot of great links there, but preparing for low bandwidth and having your links organized so that you can, um, you're not trying to surf around in the middle of the race. We're going through on Piwacket right now, you know, how big a satellite data package do we buy? And obviously we're, you know, a, a big boat with, you know, full pro crew. It's a big budget, but still it's expensive. And part of the challenge as a navigator is to shift gears from what you do at home and what Chris has with his 12 screens and computers for low bandwidth and being prepared and understanding where to get that information simply is good. The fear, fear of missing out and the fear of a better option. There's always more weather models. Gosh, did Transpac last year and there were like five pretty easily accessible global weather models. And it was hard not to look at all of them all the time. But at some point as you, as you get better at what you're at weather routing, you realize that it's, it's better sometimes to simplify. And our, as I say, our Marine Weather University classes can't help you. Chris already talked about this place, the OPC, a must under must go to um, place that you need to navigators need to familiarize yourself with. Here's how you help out. Um, one of the things that I do before um, a big race is I put together my links and do a Word document so that I can easily, if I have to, get to those places without doing any surfing. Routing practice, you've got to get to be, the more fluent you are on doing weather routing of whatever program you use, the better you're going to be able to do it in the heat of battle when you're sleep deprived, cold, or you know, not as comfortable as you are sitting in your office chair. Start doing it now. You need to become fluent in ensemble routing, not because you're going to use it during the race, but it'll become really helpful in the 10 or so days leading up to the race and allowing you and your crew to get your head around the game plan. Somebody asked a question in the chat room, how do I, should I bring my, my uh, blast reacher? Well, the answer is we don't, you shouldn't select your sail package until right before the start. I mean, you're, you and your sailmaker will looking at the optimum and the averages. If you do that historical study with Chris's grip files could come up with a good overall package that you can choose from. But your final package of which sales you're going to bring are going to come down to the weather that you see setting up. And doing this ensemble routing is a great way to do this. Here, Expedition's just gone in and gotten 30 weather models for the, from the GFS, 30 different variations of the GFS model. It's available right through um, on the internet and um, done optimal routing. And we've produced a matrix just like Chris did for, with his historical but with, you know, up 10, 14 days into the future, you can start routing the, um, the race. Here, I just did it um, for Piwacket. That's a pretty fast race, huh? Four days, 13 hours. But, and then you convert that information out to Excel. We teach how to do that in, um, in Marine Weather University. In fact, I'm going to recommend that, that some of you navigators that want to learn more about this take our preparing for Transpac course, which will have very similar wind and weather information, but we'll also have a lot of this uh, navigational stuff. Low bandwidth uh, routing and understanding the limitations of weather models, because once you get into weather routing and expedition or whatever program you use, your, your understanding of that you're not following a dotted line and turning off your brain you're using them, those weather models and the routing as a tool. It's not the answer. It's another piece of information that your brain uses. And that the advanced course in Marine Weather University on weather models is a great one. One of the things that I like practicing doing before the uh, race is figuring out how to, as a navigator, deliver the message and how you communicate with the sailing team. I'm a big fan and every boat's run differently but being very inclusive. A lot of times the navigator may not be the most experienced person on the boat, maybe not even be the person that makes the final decision. 
but the navigator is doing the data processing and getting the information in. However you do it, being efficient with how you communicate the type of information that happens at every watch change when they come to the crew comes to the computer and says, what's going on? What happened? And what can I expect for the next six, four hours, et cetera? That you can get better at by practicing. In fact, I do some coaching with teams where we do just that. And we set our practice sessions. You're out, you've just crossed the ridge, do a practice five minute briefing on download a new grip file, pretend you're here and do it. It's, it's, it's important. Important. Be inclusive. Like I said, the more people are involved with understanding, they don't have to all be decision makers. The more people understand the situation, the better the team spirit and the more buy-in you'll get with the decisions you make. Have a practice system and nomenclature. I threw out some terms quickly in the early part of the course, VMC, BMG, QRS, HRR. There's a lot of stuff there. Let's make sure that everybody is on the same page when you get into the race that you're going to be talking to. And there, and we all, if not agree on, we understand the language that we're speaking. I talked about getting buy-in. And here's a really important thing for you navigators. Spend time on deck. Look at the sky. Look, watch the wind on the instruments. Or, you know, I go up and just grab the wheel from time to time to, because that's the best way to be in touch with what's going on. It really, really helps clears your mind, and also gets you more in touch with the actual weather rather than just sitting there down below in bucks. Don't wake up surprised. Ideally, a navigator, I like to be not standing a watch, but floating. If you can talk your, if you, the team can afford that, that's a good way to go. Then you can take between one and one, 30 minute to two hour, maybe one hour and a half naps every six, eight hours or so, whenever you feel sleepy, that's how I roll. And uh, I always make sure when I'm going down for one of my naps that I have things set up. I've set up with the watch captain, I've set up constraints. If the wind goes outside of this range, wake me up. The wind does this, you know, if you set up some parameters so that you get woken up, if anything go, goes unexpectedly and you um, can therefore not wake up surprised and having to make a decision. Stay rested. This is not for heroes. Make sure you get enough rest because sleepy people that are overly tired make poor decisions. So what's a modern navigator have to do? Well, they got to do the sailing instrument operation, these new displays and stuff. I, we got a new one on PIWAC. I don't even, I'm going to have to read the manual. Know how to calibrate the sailing instruments. You've got to be good, at least fluid in the networking setup of your system, even if you didn't set it up and how to work the computer, sir, computers, the sailing software operation interfacing, got to be good at weather routing, you got to be good at race tracking, we don't talk about it much here, but I talk about it in that Transpac course, that's a really good thing, in fact, the Caribbean 600 is coming up for you navigators, go get, if you have Expedition, download, copy and track the race and Expedition, practice race tracking before the start of the race. Don't do it for the first time in the race. It can be really helpful in making decisions, even if the positions are delayed. You got to be good at communication. You got to be able to bail and bucket, right? You're probably the first person that sees a little bit of extra water down below. You got to be able to be good at cooking and making that coffee and for the crew. And you got to navigate. A quick little overview of uh, race boat electronics and satellite data. We, again, there's a lot more of this in the Transpac course. My general philosophy is keep your electronics simple. Don't get too fancy. It's gonna be in a harsh environment. The last thing you need is for something to malfunction because it's a, you know, you're using non-marine grade stuff or it's designed by the owner's IT department who knows nothing about the, a boat and the way the boat works. Uh, get an installation by Marine Electronics Professional. There's some great ones up in the Bay Area. Prepare for extreme conditions. Think about where the waterway go. In fact, on this boat where the picture was taken, we I remember sailing on it where the water would level and the whole bilge was about where, where the cradle point was. Think about, have a backup plan. Know what, how, what are you gonna do if this goes underwater? 
if the computer goes down. Do you have a bring a backup computer in the race? I do. Safety considerations. There's a picture of a boat I was navigating in the Fastnet race a few years ago, the Rambler 100, one of the super maxis, and it turned upside down when the keel fin broke off. And uh, that reminded me and refreshed, hammered home the importance of safety. Now the navigator has a role in man overboard situations and in any emergency situation. You need to know how the man overboard button works and the procedures of uh, dealing with a man overboard. You're gonna be an important part of that. You're going to be monitoring VHF 16 as I always have the crew on deck monitoring it as well in case I'm sleeping or you don't wanna turn the volume too loud down below because people are sleeping. So we always have the uh, <coughs> on watch have a handheld. We have two handholds and just cycle them through so that the boat is always listening to channel 16. I'll make a promise to you guys. Any race that I'm on, I'm going to be listening. My boat's going to be listening to channel 16. And if you call for help, we're going to come try to help. And I have one request of you. Please monitor channel 16 because someday I'm going to be calling for help. I've done it before. And I hope that somebody has their ears on. Everybody has your ears on. That's it may, It's a, probably a race requirement, but it's something that is easily not over, not followed as strictly or as clearly as it could be. Understand your hardware, have all your emergency contact numbers. Think about it. if somebody gets hurt, what's the doctor's number? What, what's the US Coast Guard a search and rescue phone numbers? Program them all into your satellite phones. Some final uh, bits of advice. There you can see a very tired navigator down below on the Rambler 100 got weather gear on, ready to go on deck because navigators don't just sit down below, they go on deck. Don't be a hero, get some rest, be efficient, practice ahead of time. It is a tough job, but it's a job you get better at with practice and it's not something you can just show up the, you know, the three days before the start and start getting things sorted out. Practice now, get the, your software on the, your home computer. Again, we may seem like we're hammering this home, but we're really proud of these Marine Weather University classes. And if you get a taste of what you might like with what we have here today with the North Sales presentation, there's a lot more of that at Marine Weather U. Uh, as I said, the, it's called, the class is called Preparing for Transpac. Go to marineweatheru.com, Preparing for Transpac. Have a look at it. That might be really, really helpful, especially for the navigators. Also for um, the speed team, and other people too. We, uh, expedition classes uh, are available at North U right now. I taught that I, I created all those. They're getting a little bit Asia, but they're still very valuable. And we have new ones coming out at Eisler Academy, including one in a couple of weeks. As I pointed out, if you want to go to Marine Weather U, please be our guest. And um, as there are free classes there, we're going to put, I'm going to put some Pacific Cup resources into the free goodies class. So just sign up there. And if you wanna take one of the more costly classes, use that coupon code. In about five, six weeks, uh, the North Sales um, Loft in San Francisco is hosting an in-person webinar, 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. about onboard sail repair. An important skill to have because you're there are going to be times where you know the, how you do in the race is whether you can put your A2 back together again. You saw you know how much of the race is downwind. Maybe you bring two A2s, but um, or your code two spinnaker. But uh, still, if there, if one blows out or if you have problems, being able to have the equipment and the knowledge of how to do sail repair is important. Um, there's the sail off there. There's uh, the sign up at, at North Sales. You can find it on their, the website and I think they'll share it with a follow-up letter to all the classes as well. So with that, I will uh, thank you guys for hanging in here and also thank uh, Chris for coming on board. And uh, we just like to uh, wish you, uh, you know, it's February, it seems like this race is a long ways away, but it's not too soon. It's to start getting prepared 
and I, the PAC Cup, um, it's, it does a great job of putting on webinars and seminars and helping people, especially teams that are doing it for the first time, and sailors doing it for the first time to get prepared for the race. But to do it at the highest level and to be fast and smart about your racing takes a really, uh, it takes practice and preparation and it's fun. So uh, good luck with it all. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. Um, we certainly thank North Sales for uh, supporting Chris and I and what we do and sharing our knowledge and we, we love doing it. So hope you can get out on the water soon.